Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military. That is the title of a terrific new book, his 12th, by our guest, Eve Engler. His website is at eveengler.com. Eve, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the work you've been doing for years. Thanks for this terrific book, Stand on Guard for Whom? Question mark. Um, your history depicts the Canadian military as growing out of the British military uh, and from the beginning being an imperial, settler, colonial, genocidal force. It seems the main difference between that and the U.S. military is Canadians participating in British imperial wars around the world. Uh, is that right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, if you go back and you look at how the British obviously conquered uh, what is now Canada and dis dispossessed Indigenous people, that was, that's the roots of the Canadian military uh, and all kinds of uh, horrors that came along with that. Um, but if you look at sort of the height of British imperialism in the late 1800s, you'll find that lots of Canadians were, you know, they were involved in conquering here within what is now Canada, but they were also involved in helping the British in India, helping the British uh, conquer, you know, all across Africa, um, uh, you know, pretty much all over the world. In fact, there was even a, the Royal Military College of Canada was set up in 1876 in Kingston, Ontario, with the purpose of, uh, as one author put it, training proper white gentlemen to be officers of British imperialism, to go and, you know, take over what is current day Ghana, to go and take over what is current day uh, Kenya. Um, so that's really the roots of the Canadian military. Um, it's not it's not hidden, uh, but it's very rarely that it's sort of framed um, in that uh, in that context. And, and you mentioned proper white gentlemen, also very much a wealthy elite run institution, the Canadian military, at least from the beginning. Right. Yeah, that that one part I found interesting to, you know, sort of look at the history of how much, you know, rich people put into um, the militia and uh, being honorary uh, uh, heads of uh, units and and also viewing the militia and training uh, young boys or you know men I guess uh, often boys teenagers uh, this was there was a kind of class element to this dynamic of of shaping the proper kind of uh, kind of person and they you know there was a quite a bit of prejudice towards uh, you know, working class people and viewing them as as uh, backwards or whatever. And also the militia early on was one of the things that was used. I mean, the first part of what it's about, the Canadian military is dispossessing indigenous people. But another part of what it what it was really about was was suppressing strikes. And they, you know, the militia sent out over and over again, dozens of times in the late 1800s, early 1900s to uh, to, you know, go on behalf of uh, employers to uh, to uh, suppress people trying to get a you know a nine hour workday or a ten hour workday and you know basic uh, uh, working conditions. Yeah, in, in fact, once the U.S. stopped attacking Canada and put up the the Monroe Doctrine, it's hard to see how Canada could have looked at its military as being needed to prevent any invasions. It had to be either for imperial expeditions far abroad or for going after the indigenous people, going after labor, going after workers, uh, going after independent movements in Quebec. I mean, is, is this how it was seen for years? I think for sure, that's for sure how it was seen. And, uh, and it was also seen as a, a tool of uh, advancing, you know, global empire, right? British empire and then quite, uh, quite quickly after World War II, uh, the US empire. Um, so the you know the Canadian elite uh, saw it as a force to uh, to uh, dispossess indigenous people to keep uh, to keep the rabble in line and to uh, to dominate the world um, and so and so it's it's a pretty remarkable um, uh, how the Canadian military sort of fluidly moved from a 
you know, appendage of the British military to really what, what it is today, which in, in many ways is an appendage of the, of the American military, uh, you know, global uh, uh, empire. Yeah, it, I mean, it's an endless and, and uh, enlightening chronicle of war after war after war, as many perhaps as the U.S. collection of past wars, but it was, it was the, the Korean War uh, period that really established a major military industrial complex and cemented that, that bond with the U.S. instead of the U.K., right? Yeah, yeah, the Korean War, I mean, about 27,000 Canadians fought in the Korean War. Uh, I mean, that's a war that's, it's, uh, it's not uh, talked about enough. Um, it's the horrors of what happened in Korea are, are quite, uh, quite remarkable. Um, millions and millions killed. Um, and Canada sent naval vessels, uh, 27,000 troops. Uh, they were, you know, they've involved in all kinds of uh, horrors, uh, including against our allies, the South Korean allies, all kinds of rapes and killings and whatnot. Um, but it was really used, uh, the Korean War was used to justify uh, a permanent war economy and a permanent war, you know, permanent military. And basically after World War II, where, you know, much of the economy and much of society was mobilized to fight uh, in that war, uh, it went back to, uh, you, know, you know, drastic reduction in the number of, of, of uh, men in the force and uh, cut, huge cuts to the budget. And the Korean War provided the justification for, for rearmament and, and, you know, sort of military Keynesianism uh, using uh, – Public spending on 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 you know, war machines uh, as a way to subsidize corporations, as a way to sort of stabilize uh, capitalism, which has the you know booms and busts uh, dynamic to it, um, and uh, and so in some ways uh, you know there was a geopolitical element to what was going on in Korea. Of course, it was partly tied to uh, you know the Chinese uh, Revolution of 1949 and sort of checking Chinese power. But in some ways, what Korea was all about from the Canadian and I think to a large extent the U.S. Uh, uh, side was was basically it was an opportunity, with, you know, three or four million may, people may have been killed, but it was an opportunity to to do some things internally within our domestic economy. Uh, and also that it had an element to in terms of uh, uh, building up force in, in, in Europe and building up NATO. Um, so, so, you know, what was really just a, you know, a civil war within Korea got turned into something that um, uh, you know, was obviously very horrible for Koreans, but it had this, you know, it was about, you know, justifying a, a, a domestic military production and, uh, and uh, building up the NATO force uh, in Western Europe. Yeah, and, and now Canada is built into a major permanent military and a major weapons dealer uh, with the, the influence of that industry setting the agenda uh, in its government, right? Just just like south of the border. Yeah, I mean, you, ha you have a situation, you know, the very publicized situation of this, this $14 billion light armored vehicle sale to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, so you have a government that has, as an official policy, a feminist foreign policy. Uh, it you know talks about peace. It talks about you know all kinds of, I would say, positive rhetoric um, about you know human rights and whatnot. But is continuing with this fourteen billion dollar uh, uh, light armored vehicle sale, and that is really a symbol. Even though it, it, the you know opposition, the public, it's an, it you know it's one of the rare instances where arms sales really become a major public issue and the majority polls there's polls out on it, and the majority of people don't want it uh, but but the the whole uh, military production is 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 uh, such an important part of of economic affairs and it's of course you know it's not just the economic uh, interest but it's tied to these same vehicles the Canadian military purchases the same vehicles and the Canadian military sees um, having domestic production of uh, land armored vehicles as you know useful from from their perspective so so there's you know major corporate interests that are profiting from it there's also just the sort of military there's all, obviously also a, a geostrategic element to it where Saudi Arabia in, despite some criticism sometimes but really Saudi Arabia is a, is a strong ally in the in the region um, 
so so yeah canada is a major arms sell, arms seller and 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 it's not um the focus on it is you know the numbers of the fact that you know there was however many billions of dollars in arms sales last year but what's kind of under discussed is that the different elements of the canadian state that are advancing those uh, arms sales. It's not just signing off on the permit. It's that literally, you know, trade commissioner uh, officials are, are going to uh, the UAE arms fair to, you know, uh, push Canadian uh, weaponry. Uh, you have Canadian diplomats that are going. You have the Canadian military. They'll, you know, they'll have their, they'll be there. They'll have a, a naval vessel that will go to port during these arms fairs. So, so really the whole Canadian state and Canadian government uh, aid, you know, even aid money goes into the, some of the, uh, you know, the trade commissioner service and the the uh, the, um, the major CADC, the major arms uh, uh, um, uh, lobby group, uh, gets you know public support. So there's just the government is really behind um, uh, this, despite again the rhetoric of you know feminist foreign policy, uh, peace, uh, whatever. They still uh, you know put all this public support behind the. Uh, uh, merchants of uh, of uh, of warfare. We're speaking with Eve Engler about his new book, "Stand on Guard for Whom: A People's History of the Canadian Military." Uh, Eve, you talk about the military being the biggest single piece of the Canadian government, but then you say it's twenty percent of federal discretionary spending. Which, if somebody said that of the U.S. military spending and the U.S. government, twenty uh, percent instead of fifty percent, I would just be ecstatic. I would, I would up the odds on humanity's survival uh, dramatically, right? I, I'm assuming this is in part a factor of what gets counted as discretionary spending in Canada and the fact that Canadians have health care and some other things uh, that we don't. Am I, am I right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the reality, and this is one of the things that I think often confronts the, the left in Canada, is that if you if the, the point of comparison is always the U.S., uh, Canada is going to look good, right? So, so um, it, it is, it, the, you know, the U.S. numbers are so off of the chart that the reality is the Canadian numbers are significantly less. And, and uh, no matter how you look at the numbers, they are, they are significantly less. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that that uh, so so you know I, I obviously completely support movements within the U.S. to to reduce uh, U.S. spending down to the twenty percent threshold. Yes. Uh, but that just because I support that doesn't mean I, at the same time I wouldn't want the Canadian threshold to be reduced from down to you know five percent or hey maybe even one uh, percent or or maybe just the marching band. Um, but you know so. So th these are these are uh, they're looked at relative, and, and, but but the the main question on 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 when you talk about like defunding the Canadian military is that what's what's the threat? There is no argument that Canada is under threat that it's about to be invaded and it needs all this this you know this new fighter jets or this new naval vessels. The, the, these things only make sense in the context of fighting in NATO and U.S.-led wars. This is not defensive. Yeah. Right? There's no there's no credible argument to say that this is defensive. And and and, and if you just look at you know where the Canadian military is right now, they're, they're, you know they're all around the globe, right? Like this is a time when we're not at war officially, but Canadian military is sort of all around the globe. Um, they're even you know setting up bases, right? There are you know, seven the planets for seven countries around the world, uh, sort of all, all the different regions of the world, uh, to, have, to have bases. Uh, you know, we talk here a lot about China and, you know, the, the aggressive China, but China has one international base, and Canada already, I believe, has four confirmed and is in the process of a, of a couple more. So, you know, and, and, and obviously Canada is just, you know, tied to the U.S. and Canadians are on U.S. bases all around the world and stuff like that. Right. Um, but but so, so, so I, I'm of the opinion that we need to, uh, you know, drastically reduce the Canadian uh, military spending. And I, I see that in, you know, in alliance, of course, with movements in the U.S. that are also uh, pushing uh, in the same direction. And your book, Eve Engler, su suggests that the Canadian military and the related industry ha are large enough that they've built their own momentum. You quote uh, generals talking about desiring new wars so that recruits get a chance to, quote unquote, serve 
uh, and in terms of the normalization of militarism, you have a story in the book that, that shocks me, even as someone living in you know, a militarized United States, uh, a military veteran acquitted of murder on the grounds that he had been trained by the military to, to commit murder. Uh, incredible to me. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he comes out of his house uh, is, uh, in the middle of the night. He hears somebody in the in the uh, in in his uh, garage up front, and he, rather than you know calling the cops, or just staying inside, comes out with his gun and uh, kills an indigenous person. Um, and his his argument for it was that that's how he was trained, uh, and uh, and therefore he you know his just his instincts went into uh, went into uh, you know overdrive, and he and he and he, and he gets off. Uh, uh, because of that. And again, we shouldn't forget that the rhetoric of Canada is this sort of, you know, peacekeeping nation, this really peaceable uh, place. Um, but the military has, you know, has a, has immense uh, uh, cultural um, uh, weight. It has, you know, the public relations. I mean, uh, the Canadian military has the biggest public relations apparatus in the country, right? They have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who are working full time to basically push the, the military's perspective on uh, on 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 uh, on things on military affairs on you know international affairs, um, uh, you know the, during the pandemic, it's shocking you see in just in recent days um, where where you know it's eight nurses that because of the huge you know COVID nineteen has gotten really bad in Alberta and there's eight nurses from the military that are going to reinforce to you know help out and there's tons of media attention about eight nurses going up and it, it, they've just done this throughout the whole pandemic of just hyping up there'll be like six six. Uh, uh, military doctors that go help out, and it's like front page of the paper. Right. Um, and and it's this 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 military, you know, cultural weight. But right behind the military cultural weight is this, you know, public relations officials of the military plus you know military uh, arms companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the guy who gets off murder charges because the military trained him. The military doesn't get convicted or even uh, accused of anything, right? Um, but this this PR effort I wanted to ask you about because, I, I mean, until relatively recent times, people in Canada didn't think of the military as humanitarian, right, as, as peacekeeping. And, uh, and, and in the U.S., we've seen that argument for militarism in recent decades, but I think not to the same extent. I think that's been much more of the push in, in the PR machine in Canada, and it's been incredibly effective, has it not? Yeah, well, Canada has a very un there's a unique, uh, I would say maybe thirty year history where peacekeeping became really part of the nat national mythology, and um, basically that goes back to the um, the Suez Crisis in 1956, where Canada sends troops to basically the British and French and Israelis invade Egypt, and the Americans are against it, and Canada sends peacekeeping force to the UN to basically extricate the, the British and French uh, from this disastrous invasion. And so it's really, you know, totally a geopolitical, it's, it's really actually Canada moving decisively from being allied with, with London to being allied with Washington geopolitically. Um, but that then unleashes this whole kind of uh, mythology and, and, and or you know, concrete Canada's contribution during the Cold War often was as uh, UN through the UN missions, like in in Congo in the early 1960s, where UN Canadian troops in the UN actually helped assassinate uh, Patrice Lumumba, the independence uh, uh, leader there. Um, but it becomes it, it takes on sort of a mythology to a point where the at one point the, we're talking like the late 18 uh, the, in the 1980s and uh, 1990s, where the military actually sees that as the best argument to justify increasing military spending. Because the population is quite uh, supportive of the idea of UN peacekeeping, and so and so the way they actually try to try to uh, you know increase their budget is by kind of putting at the forefront the idea of Canada needing a big force to be in, be able to be engaged in, in peacekeeping missions. That change that has changed since the um, the Afghan uh, the war in Afghanistan, where the, you know the really hardline militarists wanted 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 much more of a you know we're just a fighting force. No, no more this like peacekeeping kind of uh, you know sissy kind of stuff where we're you know where we go and kill and and that's what we do as the Canadian uh, uh, military. Um, so, but but still, the population of course is still when you when you poll them, they're very they're very sympathetic to the military. 
they're not really sympathetic to what the military wants to do, which they're not sympathetic to NATO and US-led wars. They're more sympathetic for the military as a, one, as a UN peacekeeping force, or two, for you know, domestic uh, disaster relief or, 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 or whatnot. Um, so, so, but yeah, this, this mythology of Canada is this peacekeeping country, um, which, you know, tied to this whole benevolent Canadian foreign policy mythology, um, is quite a, quite a powerful mythology. And, and unfortunately, it's, uh, our, 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 our friends to the South have, have, I think, contributed to some of this mythology of framing Canada in this way, uh, in, you know, in juxtaposition of, 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 of U.S. society, Michael Moore being, uh, one of the people who I think has done a lot of that stuff, um, you know, understandably at one level, but, but, um, uh, I, in my opinion, it, it, it's a, it, it blocks us from understanding uh, Canada's real position in the world and, uh, and quite frankly, how much work there is to be done to overcome a militarist, imperialist uh, Canadian foreign policy. Yeah, well, as you said a minute ago, if the United States is a standard, then we can't go after the militarism anywhere else on the planet. It's it's off limits because it all looks good, uh, and and that shouldn't be the case. Um, and but I think also a lot of the same tactics to pretend to humanitarianism uh, are seen in the United States and in Canada. You you cited examples of sending troops to Haiti on the pretense that it was to help out in an earthquake. You know, the United States does this stuff all the time, using NATO as uh, somehow a means of making things legal-ish, uh, including foreign bases and military spending and selling weapons to the United States because of NATO. Uh, I mean, the United States uses these same sorts of of arguments. Um, I also thought it was very interesting the extent to which uh, you talked about the Veterans Affairs uh, Department pushing pro-war propaganda in Canada. Yeah, I mean, that, that's when, one of the things when we talk about the military budget, we don't even count Veterans Affairs, right? So that's another like $7 billion and thousands of employees. But they, they're involved in uh, all kinds of um, all kinds of uh, uh, promotion of, of Remembrance Day, which is which is coming up in on November 11th, uh, uh, and they have all kinds of you know gatherings where they they fund hundreds of, of uh, groups across the country to to uh, have celebrations of diff different sorts. Uh, and uh, if you go on to their, you know, their, if you look at how they describe the Korean War or World War One, it's always Canada was fighting for freedom. But I mean, like, you really don't need to look very you know, far to know that in World War One, this was, you know, height of, of imperial lunacy that led to, you know, millions and millions of people being killed for really for, for almost uh, you know, nothing. Um, uh, but that's, 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 you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars every year through Veterans Affairs uh, is used to, uh, to, you know, push a perspective of, of uh, Canadian military history onto the, uh, onto the public. And they have all kinds of, uh, 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 you know, um, partnerships with different, you know, sporting things. Actually, here in Montreal, um, uh, there's a, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the team football league has their, has their, uh, the Montreal Alouettes have their, have their game. And they have, right now we're, there's flyovers with the Canadian military doing flyovers of the game. And, you know, Veterans Affairs is all tied into that with partnerships with the different sports leagues to, to push, um, uh, push militarism, really. Uh, it's all framed kind of under, uh, you know the the people who 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 died uh, uh, fighting, uh, but really what it's about is pushing uh, pushing militarism. Uh, again, we're speaking with Eve Angler. This wonderful book is called "Stand on Guard for Whom: A People's History of the Canadian Military." And Eve, usually there are entire chapters of books that I don't like, even though I like the whole book. With your book, there were two sentences I had any sort of quibble with, uh, and they were pretty much the same sentence in two different parts of the book. And they were World War II was justified, uh, or words close to that. And I, I, I wondered about that because you didn't say exactly why World War II was justified. It seems to me it could have been avoided in a number of ways. Could have been avoided even just by withholding Western corporate corporate support uh, from Nazi Germany. 
um, and nonviolent activism could have been used in major ways that it wasn't, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I ask only because this ginormous U.S. military spending budget is justified each and every year for the past 75 years, principally because of World War II. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't argue for any of these other wars, just that one. So I'm, I, I'm curious why you would, would put that in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I, I've read your you great uh, uh, writing on, on World War II, and I, and I agree with that it was, totally, it was an unnecessary war. The point I'm trying to make is that once things had been, obviously the Canadian government shouldn't have you know, brought in a law to stop Canadians from going to uh, Spain to, to you know, fight against the rise of Franco, and that, in, that enabled... Um, uh, Nazis, Nazism that enabled uh, uh, Mussolini, uh, and and obviously, like you say, uh, different um, uh, corporate uh, relationships. Um, the Canadian reason for going to World War II was not because they wanted to, uh, you know, protect uh, Jewry, Jewry from being, you know, annihilated by uh, by the Nazis or or because they, uh, you know, dis disliked uh, uh, fascism. It was to support the British Empire, which was threatened by by the Nazis' uh, rise. But once the situation had become, once they'd done uh, uh, allowed for all this to, to develop, I think ultimately um, um, the uh, it, it was you know it's justified at the they shouldn't it, there's things they could have done to avoid it having happened and those things should have been done and and we shouldn't obviously we, that history is really important and we need to need to uh um uh discuss that but my point in 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 uh putting that forward is to say that um that uh it's, it's mostly about the other wars to be really clear that the other wars are all uh clearly immoral but that um uh you know i'm not i'm not a I'm not a I'm not a strict pacifist. I, I think that uh, you know, overwhelming that's the case that that we that we can. There's different ways of avoiding um, uh, military confrontation and and uh, and you know, 99.9 percent .9 of the time, uh, militarism is a is a is a is a bad thing. Uh, but but I think there you know it's um, yeah. Uh -huh. We've got about one minute left. I'm sorry to say we could go on for hours, but I, I don't know how, what could have been worse than at least 50 million people killed. Uh, and I don't know how we get it down to just a marching band, as I would love to do, as you proposed earlier, if we suggest that some of the wars uh, make sense. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's not about saying that some of the wars make sense. It's about, uh, how how I framed that was is more that that the other ones are clear cut immoral, right? Uh, the World War II is more complicated. That would be, I think, maybe the more nuanced way of 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 putting it out there. Um, but I, I don't I don't I don't I I, I don't believe that that um, you know there are um, there are national resistance wars that uh, fighting that 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 I think are are legitimate. What we have to look. M you know, warfare. We, yes, we want to try, try to eliminate warfare and militarism, um, but there well, there can be legitimate forms of uh, of uh, of taking up arms. Maybe I I don't think in this age of understanding the power of nonviolent activism, but it's a topic for another show. I hope we can have you back on. Uh, everybody should get a copy of this book, A People's History of the Canadian Military. Stand on guard for whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military by our guest Eve Engler. Eve, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot for having me. David Swanson, take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.